Okay. Shall we start? This equation is correct. I was, I got, I got yep. Yep. So, this one, please. Okay. okay, I'll start again. I apologize. Okay, um, okay so sorry, I, I'll, I will continue. I'll start again. So, we have this mean field. So, we've, so far, we've only spoken about the, the single, but not the non interacting electronic picture, where we basically threw away all of the electronic, electronic terms in the Hamiltonian. So, we could solve this. We use a single electron. Separable idea where we can solve the total electronic wave, total molecular wave function in its single electron pieces. And what, what we do is we use this mean field. So, 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 so then we, so the, 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 to take the, the theory further, we want to introduce the electronic electronic interaction. So it, the true electronic Hamiltonian is, it, it's not. The electronic interactions are kind of unsolvable in this single electron picture. But the, what you can do is you can add in this mean field term. Now, I, I quite like this figure because it, it kind of shows you what the mean field is actually doing. And it kind of makes a lot of intuitive sense. So we had this, the electron density peaks around the nuclei. Right? So that we saw that in the previous plot. And this is, what, this is kind of the three-space the three picture. So kind of the mean electron density is always going to be greater around the nuclei because they're attracted due to the due to the electro the, the electro the Coulomb interactions. So you kind of you got this. Can, can we treat this background fixed potential um, with our uh, with our Hamiltonian? So the idea is quite simple. Can we get this extra mean field term? Um, and the, and the mean field, formally the mean field is defined as kind of the density, is the density. So you integrate the density. Yeah. So you basically, yeah, this, this basically gives you a three-dimensional plot of these electronic nuclear cusps. So, as, so, so now, now we've got this. So, so now we have this term, which is essentially, is, if you notice, we've integrated out all the variables here. So this is just a, a like this is just a once we have the density, it's just the constant. So let's assume we have the density for now. Then we can solve this mean field Hamiltonian with the separable methods that we had before. So we can what we can use to to solve the global molecular wave function. We can use uh, a product of singular molecular, single electronic wave functions, and this is known as the famous Hartree product. Again, this was determined in about 1929, I think, um, by Hartree. He was an expert in differential equations from World War One in ballistics. So then he he was at Cambridge and then basically applied all that knowledge to solving differential equations. Of the Schrodinger equation. Yeah. So there's a product of single electron wave functions. Uh, and 
because the mean field operator is still a one electron operator because we've integrated over all space out the distance, we can use this. But it's not anti symmetric, and electrons are indistinguishable. So, this is, so there's a lot wrong with it, but I'm just trying to show you the <coughs> motivation. So it turns out that although the dent if, when you have a density, it is solvable. Um, so say if we're given some um, uh, we're given some electrons in like in space on a spin orbital. We can solve uh, we can solve this here because this this term can be solved, and then the, these electrons. This is the, the potential term, and this is the kinetic term. But you might notice that when you solve this you get a new solution of the spin orbitals. So this is a kind of, it's a nonlinear equation. It's, it's an, so you, you get this, by solving this to input density, you get a new density here. And then by sol for, for one set of spin orbitals, you, sol you solve the equation, and you get a new set of spin orbitals. So it's this nonlinear equation. So you, what you have to do is you have to keep iterating over this. And this is called, you might have heard of what's called the cell consistent field. Because the field has to become, this field term has to become consistent and, and like kind of optimized to kind of this con like constant. Um, now, I must say, we can't use linear combination of atomic orbitals in this approach because the, um, but I, sh I should say, sorry. The if so, there are some. And the reason why this there's no basis here so far. This is all just using differential equations. So this is an integral differential equation, and they are solvable in some cases. So the famous one is the again the spherically symmetric um, nuclei. So you can actually solve the Hartree-Fock equations or the Hartree equations for for a nuclei. So you so you can for example fluorine with lots of in the core electrons, you can still solve that exactly because of the spherical symmetry. There's some, there's some quite nice, um, that on, if you look online, there's some very good de de like step, some very good resources showing this. But as soon as you go away from spherical symmetry into molecular picture, then you kind of have to start solving things with a basis. So you, you need to use a basis in the same way that we use linear combination of atomic orbitals. But due to numerical problems, those aren't suitable. Okay, so, um, and I will come on to why that is in a second. But as I said before, this is a very crude picture, I apologize. But when you go to helium, so you start, this is the first solution. This is, this is the first case of the differential, first case of the Schrodinger equation where, sorry, the first case of the, where you have core electrons, two electrons, you start noticing that that you get these anti-symmetric and symmetric solutions, whereas in reality they were only observing these anti-symmetric solutions. So this is kind of the first first case where they started to think it was like experiment. This kind of first proof that that they didn't that the anti-symmetry is needed. Okay, so what is anti-symmetry? So it's quite simple because because the electrons, the physical solutions were anti-symmetric. They realized the electrons had to be anti-symmetric with respect to particle exchange. <laughs> I just put because the universe. <laughs> Apparently, if you go to the quantum field theory, there is actually der derivations for this, but it's kind of an observation effort for, the, for our purposes. So going into the previous method where we have this Hartree product, we now we, we take this single electron picture, but we, have to, we give it the constraints that it has to be anti-symmetric with respect to the particle exchange. So we take the simple two-electron Hartree product, two-spin orbital Hartree product, and we see that obviously that because there's two terms, we have this normalization factor here, one over root two. And we show that we, we've moved... That should be... Sorry, yeah, there's a mistake here. These, these x, that should be two. So these x's should be, should be swapped. But basically, you, you see you have this swap table term. 
uh, which is the exchange. And that, that very neatly can be expressed as a um, that can be very neatly expressed as a, a determinant. So if you take the determinant of the if you take the if you take the determinant of this, you'll then get this and you get the equation from the previous slide. And then we represent it kind of compactly as this ket. So the ket contains the anti-symmetry here. Now this generalizes to n electrons or n spin orbitals with or so n electrons. Um, and it has all the same properties. So if you, if you, you know with determinants, if you move columns and rows, you'll, you'll flip the signs, things like that. OK, so what this is showing is that we have this heart of a single electron picture, wave function, this product wave function, but it can actually account for the anti-symmetry. OK, so you can see here, as, as, as you exchange the columns, you get the the sign flipping. And exchanging the columns is, is equivalent to exchanging the electrons. Have this bra ket notation. OK, so what, what does it do to our operator? So I don't have time to derive the Hartree-Fock equation, but you just have to take it from me. If you go back to this equation, so this is the mean field equation. So we have, we have this mean field term where we're integrating over all the spin orbitals, all their positions. Now, in dependence of anti-symmetry, you basically get, you get th th this result. This falls out. And your, your mean field term has what's called the Coulomb term. Which is kind of electro, electro mutually. So the, the electronic electronic interaction has got a physical un understanding, and then you've got the exchange term. Now this doesn't have a physical interpretation. It's purely a facet of the anti-symmetric, the necessary anti-symmetry in the equation. But you, you can see what the difference is. There's still two electron. We're still integrating over the two electron over over the density here, but then on the exchange. Get the density of it. Here you've exchanged these two particles. So it looks like a two particle operator, but you're, now, but you're, you're actually integrating out the variable, so it's still a mean field operator. It's a bit confusing. And this, because this is a one electron operator, because it's integrating out the, the terms, um, so it, I think it's quite remarkable, really, that. You have a one electron operator that still accounts for anti-symmetry, and anti-symmetry is a property of two particles. Right. Um, so yeah, so this is the this is a solution for the whole whole molecule. And we've got the sum over i here, where i is the number of spin orbitals. And then j is the number of spin orbitals as well. Um, yeah. So you've got the Coulomb term, which is an average instantaneous point charge of portions, that is density. And then the exchange term, which exists only for anti-symmetry. And this, this causes a lot of problems. So one of the exercises will be to kind of try to understand this a bit more. So we, we can then take the hartree fock Molecular operator, and then we can, because it's a one electron operator, we can then use the same trick of using separable differential equations. And we can solve a single electron picture. So that, and this gives us what's known as the Fock operator. Now this is really important. So, what is the Fock operator? So, we have inside the Fock operator, we have our kinetic term, and then we have our term which accounts for the and the potential is contained in here as well. Yeah, so we have so we we, we the one we call this the one electron operator, and we we take we take the so this has got the one electron 
kinetic and the one electron potential. And then we have the mean field potential term. Uh, the mean field potential term, which contains, which, which is a, which kind of is our approach in this picture to, to have electron electron interaction, which has this exchange, this Coulomb term, and then this exchange term where we've flipped over the exchange there. So it, it's quite strange because you you're solving. You have the J's run, you run over all J's, and then I is the solution that you're trying to solve for. So, that, so that's what you get here. So it's. So again, you have this kind of feedback loop where you're solving for I, then I's got to go back into the equation. Okay. Then again, we have this iterative self-consistency condition. But now we've got this kind of anti-symmetrized mean field operator. So you can think of Hartree Fock as just an anti-symmetrized mean field operator. Um, but it must be solved uh, iteratively, and that's why you, get, you might hear self-consistency used. Um, OK. So, I was, this was all solved, for the purpose of the previous discussion, we were just treating this as a differential equation, if, as if it could be solved analytically. But we know that it can't for, for molecules. So, so for multinuclear centers, there's no analytical closed form solution. So we have to solve what's called the Fock, the brief at least it's called the brief equation. And essentially, it's, it's the secular equation, but with the, the um, it's the secular equation with the, with the FOC operator. As a nonlinear equation, because we sort of maybe have this feedback loop. So we introduce what's known as a finite basis. Now, as I said before, we can't use the linear combination of atomic orbitals <coughs> due to numeric, because of the numerical problem. Of orthogonality. But we can still use the ideas from the generalized secular equation. But the problem is we need to, we need to find a basis. So what is a basis? And I, this is something which is very subtle, and I think is where a lot of people kind of get confused in quantum chemistry. So you have what well, essentially we have this spin orbital, and we introduce, so let's say. The, that this car analogy is quite nice. The black here is the, t is the exact wave function, right? But we want to we want to introduce a basis. So we have these weightings. These red circles are these are these eaters, and we can weight the eaters with this c. And the more the more eaters that you have, the better approximation to your overall wave function will be. So the, the basis is kind of like you mangle it together to the shape of the orbital that we showed in the hydrogen picture. So it's quite subtle. Like you're, you have this molecular bonding picture, but it's made up of these smaller blocks, which is like your Lego, essentially. It, so it's, it's really quite subtle. So the, what, the, the stuff we show for benzene, things like that, the, you, you essentially you build that from a smaller set of basis functions, we call them. So if you've got more balls, a larger basis, You'll get you'll get a more accurate answer. If you have different shaped balls, so you, typically you have angular, different angular momentum shapes as well. You'll get a better and you get a better fit to exactly exact wave function. So there's a huge amount of research in quantum chemistry into building basis functions for different things. So, for example, you might have sto 3 g 6G1G, double zeta basis sets. Things like that. Okay. Okay. So, so what? What typically what you do is you, they're, they're, rather than the balls, they're formal mathematical functions. 
where we're trying to fit the exact wave function onto uh, with, with these kind of with this finite basis here. Okay, so and t typically, like a good example is Gaussian. So you, you combine a load of Gaussian. So how it works is people in the 70s and the 80s, people spent a long time fitting these basis functions to get the mathematical functions, these eaters. So you, the Gaussian parameters, like the tweaking, these were done quite rigorously and it's by like Popel and his colleagues at the Papal basis sets. So, so now, essentially, we just have this fixed set of Lego blocks that we apply to our problem. So we can then build these fitted Gauss, build our density structures, for example, for our bonding orbitals from a set of Gaussians, for example, <coughs> or slater type orbitals. <coughs> and what's, what, what's nice, because of what I said about the variational principle, the secular equation will always find the exact the, the minimum energy for a finite basis. So you can obtain your bonding orbitals by directly just solving the Fock secular equation. So it's, it's very powerful and very cool. And this is why we haven't got to quantum computing yet. This is why you need to do all this class like old school quantum chemistry first to build the shape of the molecular orbitals because you have these numerical parameters which are your basis functions. Numerically fitted basis functions which then build up these orbital shapes like benzene and, and hydrogen and H2. Okay, so the basic examples of the basis functions, the two, the two main ones are uh, for molecules at least, you have slater type orbitals which are exponentiated to the single power of R. Uh, we know from the Cato theorem, which is basically says that the nuclear cusps are like these, these finite peaks. This is exactly what a state, these slater type orbitals, these slater functions fit, right? And the problem is they're very mathematical, they require a lot more mathematical work to solve them when you start applying them into the secular equation. So typically, just for numerical purposes, we use Gaussian-type orbitals, because the, the reason for this is the product of two Gaussians is a Gaussian. So you can then iterate that over these four center Gaussians, and then you get a single Gaussian. So it makes the numerical stuff much easier. So you can see here in this figure, um, that, so this is the, this is the Slater-type orbital and then we've got these Gaussians best approximating it. Yeah. So we have lots of Gaussians, you can, in the combination of Gaussians, you can quite accurately uh, fit the Slater type functions. So what, what, what Popel and colleagues did was they basically fitted loads of Gaussians to these Slater functions. So, so ST03G is Slater type orbital, but it's made of Gaussians. Okay. Slate type orbital three Gaussian. Okay, so let's take this. If we know this is where it gets quite advanced. So we take the spin orbitals that we had before for this. For, for this, so this is the Fock equation, the Fock operator. So it's for the energy. We integrate. So this is a bra operator cap. But we're just not showing it in direct notation. We're integrating a real space for a single, like, single spin orbital. Now we expand out the uh, we, we expand out the the operator in terms of the spin orbitals. We're going to get the, the one electron exchange in the Coulomb term. Now, when we apply this equation, the basis equation. So say we pick some basis functions, eta. We then substitute that into the previous equation, and the Fock operator takes this form. Okay, so, so you notice now we've got this extra 
So the, the g's are these, these orbital integrals. And then the c's are the weightings of each, or of each of these basis function terms. Okay, so see, the flock operator just got a lot more complicated. And you can see that because we have this is a, this is a bat. Because you have these, because we have orbitals inside the operator, when the Fock operator then has these C parameters inside of it, so so you can so, so you can see like yeah, so re really importantly, the Fock operator has orbital parameters inside of it in the basis expansion. Now you can see, you, you can now see that why that would be nonlinear, because you solve f, which has c in it, to get c. So you still have to start these from around. Now, and so going back to our benzene example, so we're not using atomic orbitals now. We're using this arbitrary basis expansion. Okay, uh, let's say sta 3 g Now, by solving the Fock operator, the Fock the Ruffian equation. Each, each eigenvector solution is one of the spin orbitals. Okay. So you can see here, say if we had some rough p orbital like basis function, but made of Gaussians, um, then the linear combination of those all add up to be like the delocalized p here. So these are all mathematical objects now. Um, and you can see we end up with the same result. And, it is, and again, because this is the sector equation, which comes from the rally rich variational principle, this is the minimum energy for each spin orbital. Okay. So just to clarify, so inside the Fock operator, we have these, these basis function overlaps. Now, these are just Gaussians here, these eta's. So you have to do, you're just doing four center Gaussian overlaps here. So there's quite, there's quite a lot of hardcore numerics going on here. Okay. So, to summarize. So Hartree Fock is essentially it's an anti-symmetrized mean field approach. And, it, it, and it's used as, it gets the rough electronic structure correct. So I, I, it's kind of, Hartree Fock really does explain a lot of the chemistry quite well. So like you can see here, by solving the Ruffian equation, because I did this with Gaussian a long time ago. Um, but it gets the, the chemistry correct. Like this, is, this is what you see in molecules. The, like the qualitative picture is correct for Hartree Fock most of the time. The problem is when you want that 1% of energy to get the transition state correct, that's when, that's when you need higher order structures. But hartree fock <laughs> is responsible for all of the kind of chemical properties you see in higher order methods, if that makes sense. Like the orbital structures, the orbital shapes, they all come from the hartree fock calculation that you do. So that's why it's so important to, 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 to verify. And like most importantly, these C, these C eigenvectors are the shape of the spin orbital. So you, you need to do a Hartree Fock calculation before a quantum, a higher order quantum computing calculation to get the shape of the spin orbital which contain the spatially dependent interactions in, in, second, in the second complex formalism. Yeah. So it's passed on to the second. Yeah, so, it's, so what I mean by the fact that Hartree Fock is passed on to the second quantized full, full configuration interaction couple cluster or quantum computing calculations is that now we're coming back to the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian that I showed you at the beginning of this lecture. Now you might understand the significance of why you have to really respect Hartree Fock to get the interaction parameters. So you can see here what this is your second quantized chemistry Hamiltonian. Now. These i and j's, these are the spin orbitals, which are themselves linear combinations of basis functions. Okay. Now the i and j's, 
So, so, so obviously, when you when you type, when you multiply out the i and j's in the basis expansions, you, you get all the linear combinations carefully just come out. So, the h i j terms are these like four rank ten, rank four tensors. Sorry, the the rank two tensor and the g i j k l is a rank four tensor of these interact of these Gaussian or Gaussian Gaussian integrals. So this is at this double thing there's the exchange in the, exchange in the Coulomb term. But you can see that you have these G, like, well you might do your quantum computing calculation and you'll get a chemistry Hamiltonian. The, the terms contain all the information about the shapes of the orbitals, basically. That, that, that's the moral of the story. Um, so your, your interaction parameters in second quantization uh, Contain the, the Hartree-Fock molecular orbitals uh, expansion coefficients. So that's why you need to do this lower level of theory calculation first, and then apply. And, and I'll, I'll explain why you need to do higher order theory in a second. So Hartree-Fock, almost perfect. It t typically gets a bonding at equilibrium joint of 99% of the energy is correct. But at bond breaking and bond forming length, it breaks down. I'll show you why. And most importantly, strong electron interactions, uh, like strong correlation, is not treated well by Hartree Fox. Um, so, more accurate methods on quantum computers are needed. So, here's an example. Okay, so got two minutes. Here's an example of where Hartree Fox starts to break down. Okay, so you've got your two hydrogen atoms. Um, at equilibrium geometry. And then you can see here, as you stretch your hydrogen, your two hydrogens, Hartree Fox starts to get way beyond the exact. So you have, and so th there's this other method called configuration interaction. Um, so the exact here is the, the, the infinite basis limit. So, okay, not interesting, but the Ci is the same basis as Hartree Fox, but it seems to get the 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 uh, dissociation limits um, correct. So, what is configuration interaction? So, if we go back to our nice, um, so this is now not uh, it's, we're not thinking about the linear combination atomic orbitals. We're thinking about Hartree Fox. But the solutions of the spin orbitals are the same, as you saw before in the benzene example. But if we have a single, if we think about the ground state, if we think about the ground state, uh, the, sing, the single determinant wave function, the ground state of hydrogen, the H2, um, this, uh, we have this two, um, it's two spin orbitals. So we have one sigma G solution times by another sigma G solution. Um, So the, the sigma G solution, is the ground state, as we showed before, has this. So we're kind of approximate. We're just showing that it's got this S orbital-like character. It's a linear, it's a positive interaction of two S orbitals. Now, when we, if we take, a, if we just roughly multiply the two things together, we get this 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 product, which yeah, this is just quadratic quadratic equation. But what you see when you multiply this out is you get four cross terms, okay? Now, the four cross terms actually end up being what we have here is both electrons on one, both electrons shared, both electrons shared, both electrons on the other one. Okay. Right? Now, if we think about when we want to go to the, the really dissociated bonds, you don't want all the, elect the electrons want to be on, on individual atoms here. They don't want to be isolated on one. Okay. So you can see you get these really unphysical allowed solutions in this expansion. So the, the electrons, went, and a long distance, the electrons really want to be separate, basically. 
So this, as so you can see, you've got these, you've got these terms here which shouldn't really be there in, in the long, long separation limit. So this single determinant picture is not adequate. So that's why we have to use this method called CI. And CI is really what motivates us to use quantum. It's, it's, the, it's the same problem that we use for quantum computing as well. And that you start to introduce these extra basis, for extra expansion. What do I mean by that? So, so extra determinants. So you have this many electron multi-determinant wave function now. So what you do is you take the solutions of the, of the Hartree-Fock. So you've got all these different Hartree. So e each one of these lines here, one, two, three, four, these are solutions to the Fock matrix. So these are eigenvectors of the Fock matrix. Uh, but I, I've just put them here as, you can see, and then, so, and so we've got sigma, sigma bonding G, sigma bonding G, and here we've got sigma bonding G multiplied by sigma star u, antibonding, sigma star u, and then sigma g, antibonding, so bonding, antibonding, bonding, and we've got two antibonding. So we, we introduce these extra determinants. So this kind of seems a bit arbitrary. Why are we doing this? But if you look now, when you combine the two, the bond, the totally bonding and anti-bonding ones in a, in a linear combination. Now, this is very important now. So we've gone from the single electron picture to the many electron basis. So, so this is now a way, a pro, this is a wave function of two electrons. Okay, so we've got, we're out of the single electron picture now. We're in, so this is what, um, so by introducing having this many electron wave function, the linear combination of these two, these two determinants, you've got determinant one, determinant two, determinant one, determinant two, but they're different. And you've got the weighting parameters. What happens is when you, when you work through the mass, you basically, the, 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 the dissociated terms, the C, you can basically, the C's, work, you get basically, a, the C's cancel basically here. So, the, so the, you have the C's, these are equally contributed, but then it causes the, the, very, the long expansion terms, the, the, the separable terms to cancel. You end up with the truly physical solution, which is the, is, is the separated, um, only the separated S orbital. So you've got S A, S B, S A, S B. And, and so, if you were to solve the secular equation for this picture in the, the main electron wave function, you'll just get this basically if you want the solution. But you can think about it in an intuitive way. So, yeah. So this, so this is what you get. So that, now the bonding is described correctly at long distances. We only, we only have these separated terms, and it's, yeah, the physical terms. So this is really the motivation for, Hartree, for configuration traction. So configuration traction is a complete generalization of this, of this problem. So now we've left Hartree-Fock behind, okay? Hartree-Fock gives us each one of these black lines. It gives us the, orbital, the spin orbital shape. And then we have this many determinant wave function, which so this, here's a six electron wave function. And then we introduce all possible combinations of excited determinants. Okay, so in, so as you saw before in the H2 example, we only, we only added an extra determinant. But in the general case, you just do all combinations of the, of, of the, of, the, of all possible excitations. So you've got here we have, the, this is called the reference wave function, which is the ground state, all the, all the, it's the lowest occupations of the Hartree-Fox solution. And then here we have the single excitation, the set of, so, so I, yeah, I should say, this is a set, so this is all possible singles. So this is just showing one single, but it represents all possible singles. 
So, so we can have. So A is the um, hole, and then R is the particle. So you get this particle hole excitation here. Um, and then we have the same for the doubles, where we do all, all possible double excitations. And then if you, and the, tr the full solution goes to the all possible excitations here. And this is kind of, it's equivalent to exact diagonalization. You might have heard of that in physics, but in chemists call it configuration detection. Because if you think about it, you're introducing all these extra configurations, electronic configurations. And then the, the, the wave function is essentially is this. So you have the C0 reference coefficient. This is just the Hartree-Fock energy, by the way, Hartree-Fock wave function. From the, this is a solution of the, of the this is the product of all the of the single electron Hotchpot solution, and then we have basically all the all this, the weightings for the singles and all the weightings for the doubles, some there but occupied virtual, etc. So we often call this oh, the occupied so the, the occupied space and then the virtual space. Okay. Now. We then get, we get our old friend the secular equation. Because you have a basis and a Hamiltonian, we can apply the secular equation. And the, we still get this optimal, like the solution to this will be optimal for the ground and excited state. But now this is, whereas before the basis scaled with the size of the basis set that you choose with Gaussian functions, here you have a combinatorially scaling matrix, okay, that's really bad, <laughs> okay, like, so this, so a, a lot of kind of quantum chemistry for the past 40 years has been devoted to solving this equation efficiently, it's just a generalized eigenvalue problem, and And essentially, so this is scaling with, well, I mean, if you were just to naively solve this by diagonalization, the, the, you can only really do up to like 10 spin orbitals. The largest known numerical solution to this uses iterative diagonalization methods, which is essentially, um, it's called a Krelov, Krelov method, and it basically allows you to, only, rather than solving the matrix, uh, Exactly, you approximately solve it using matrix vector products and iterations of that. The largest solution of that with the Lanchos method is 44 uh, uh, spin orbitals, 22 spin orbitals, 22 electrons and 44 spin orbitals. So you can't really do anything, interest, any large molecules interestingly with this. And you're not going to get over, like the, the, the amount of effort that they put in to get one extra spin orbital there. Was was crazy because you're, you're, you're fighting against a combinatorial scaling problem. So this really motivates me for quantum computing because if your basis scales combinatorially, um, it's actually slightly less than two to the n combinatorial. Um, in this case, um, for the particle number, but you can really see why we need quantum computing methods because. Quantum chemistry has been stuck here for about 40 years trying to solve this problem. Okay, we're not going to get past it with like classical methods. Really, I mean, it's just a hack. All the new methods are hacks to solve this slightly more efficiently. Like, how can we keep the most most of the wave function that treats that tr treats the interesting part of the wave function? But if we really want to solve this solve this problem fully, we need quantum computers to go to like interesting systems. Now, there's an there's lots of arguments in quantum chemistry that we don't need to treat the whole, whole system. We only need to treat the sites of interest, like the active sites, things like that. Garnet Chan will probably tell you about all his methods and perturbation theory, solving the chromium dimer, and, and DMET, for example. Um, so the, it, it, the, the argument is true that is it necessary to solve this for everything? No. But for some systems which have very strong electron correlation, this is needed 
because it's still only the nitrogenase example uh, that does the hard process in the soil is a good example of this. And very importantly, this gives you excited states as well. So you get the excited state energy. This is a semantic eigenvalue problem. OK. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about this. So what is second quantization? I mean, I brief, briefly alluded to it, just because probably people are familiar with it. The second quantization, second quantization essentially takes the distance dependence from the, from the wave function. So you don't have any of these functions of R anymore, your wave function. It takes that and then puts it into the operator, as you saw in the previous slide. Then it means that we can treat the, the basis in the occupation number formalism. Uh, with just ones and zeros. And it gives us this rigorous mathematical footing. This is what, one more image. Um, and these, 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 uh, this, basically the, the determinant like properties that we saw in first quantization, where you can exchange the rows and columns, etc. These are all represented in the same way by these fermionic creation annihilation operators. So you see, you, can, you, can, you have this vacuum state, which is this empty cap. Then you excise this, and you get a spin orbital p existing. Same way it happens here, you can destroy uh, chi p. You get an empty cap. And then you can just apply them in, in succession. And then you can see, th this is the really important one here. So you can see if you, have, if you destroy p, if you apply them, in this order, yeah, PQ. If you, if you exchange PQ via the use of the fermionic, rather than exchanging the rows of the state of determinant, if you just do it via the fermionic creation annihilation operators, you still get the same properties. But this is now done rather than at the wave function level by moving around the, the determinant, it's done at the operator level via these operators. Um, and there's obviously there's all these famous commutation relations here. Anti-commutation relations, I should say. Sorry. Whoops. Um, yeah. But the, the main idea is that these, op these operators preserve the symmetry. Okay. So finally, I guess, this is kind of, so what we've just spoken about with configuration interaction is known as post hartree fock but as I said, Hartree, these post hartree fock methods require hartree fock to be done beforehand. So that, that's why you need to download PySCS before you do your quantum computing calculation. You run your hartree fock calculation, you give it your nuclear coordinates, you choose your basis set, you then get an output of optimized orbitals and electronic integrals. You then give these electronic integrals to your configuration interaction. Or you could use couple cluster or whatever method, there's more of them. But in particular, the point here is that quantum chemistry, quantum computing, just is exactly the same as configuration traction, basically, in terms of what it requires from, to be run beforehand. So you need these optimized integrals in the second quantized form of quantum computing to work. I'll probably stop there, I think. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any questions? Thanks, Nathan. Question? No question. <laughs> Take a break. Uh, next, Nathan talk will start to. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next, Nathan talk will start uh, at 20, 20 past 11.